Given the history of framing, in a legal sense, the image of the black culture, Parker's treatment promises to be a landmark depiction rather than another weak-willed disappointment. We're already witnessing that Parker's being put to the test with tremendous pressure. The film is not even out yet, and already there's pushback against it and him in the form of attempts to discredit Nate Parker with republicizing rape charges against him that he was cleared of 17 years ago. Here in this post-Ferguson, Missouri era, okay, with the rise of organizations like Black Lives Matter okay, and the color of change, among others, seeking justice and equity in response to the ongoing murderous bloodless perpetrated by the police and civilian races from coast to coast, the film industry's superiority propagating powers that be have been once again put on notice that they need to come correct. As a student of the film industry's libelous abuse of the image of black people and black culture, let me tell you, there's an immense historical precedence for the impact that pressure groups have had on these beings. The enlightening pressure is put on by the fiery rhetoric of the African American Studies graduate actor Jesse Williams. Hmm? a graduate of Temple's African American Studies program, okay? Bless his future career with these white folks. Is, it, is an indication that he and the black intellect cannot thrive on Dr. Cotton soft, Dr. Cotton soft and innocuous Tyler Perry and Lee Daniels films, nor more stupid Ice Cube barbershop flicks. <laughs> Here on the eve of the Esteem Wright Museum series of recognitions of Detroit's year rebellion, it has been 185 years since Nat Turner made his move, which contributed to the making of the enslavement of the Amer Africans in America, a matter of numbered days and years. Okay? After the death and destruction that Nat Turner brought to slaveholders' doors, the quote, peculiar institution, their name, end quote, of wringing prosperous white lifestyles from black, and men, black men and women's brows and free labor was on the short end of its existence. Being the embodiment of the fighting spirit laid down in David Walker's appeal, the choice of revolutionary rebellion instead of further acquiescence to the tyranny of slavery is the quintessential definer of what Nat Turner represents in the long history of the enslaved Africans' resistance to an increasingly overbearing captivity. I thank you for your attentiveness. Uh, can you line up behind uh, the mics? Uh, we are live streaming and videotaping this program, so speak clearly into the mic. Uh, if you do have a statement, uh, limit uh, the statement so that we can uh, uh, complete our program. Again, if you have any questions for Dr. Melvin Peters, uh, please come to the mics. Thank you. Curious, what did uh, James Baldwin think of the novel, Steiger's novel, after it actually came out? <laughs> uh, the quote that the quote that I read, uh, and I happen to have a conversation with Baldwin about this. Uh, a former colleague of mine uh, he used to run Black Ethnic Studies at Bowling Green, Robert Perry, and he had Baldwin. Baldwin taught there for two years. Uh, but the quotation, the blurb that's on the back of the book says, at last we have started to write our common history. Somehow that seems short of unqualified praise. <laughs> to say go for it, um, you know, they were, they were uh, compatriots, you know, as, as he pointed out, Baldwin lived in his house okay, uh, for a while, you know. But no, he didn't. You know, he didn't go on and on and on and, and praise the book as a, as, a, as, as a great work. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm Ashley, and I'm from the state.
state of Virginia, born and I'm, I'm, I'm from West. I'm from West Virginia. Come on, girl. yeah. Well, you know, we got an argument going like Michigan and Ohio. Well, you, Virginia's and, and West Virginia got a thing going on. <laughs> but anyway, I was born in Cortland, Virginia, which was known as Jerusalem. I was born in 1928. Oh, and I don't have as much of a question as I do uh, have to give just a few comments because I lived it, but I don't mean that I lived during the time of that term, even though my children tell me to tell everyone 1928, just tell them that you were born before Christ, B.C. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, I had many struggles, but uh, I'm here to say that I had tears of joy while you were speaking, because I remember so many times back in those days how my father was threatened because he was the president of NAACP, and I used to be in that car, that truck, when he would go way back up in the woods at the time, it seemed like he was going about 10 miles. Mm -hmm. And I would be in the truck where he would go back to pick up a lot of men and put them in that truck and take them to the poll place where my dad paid the $2 for the poll tax. Mm -hmm. However, I would be sitting in the front saying, why is he giving them that money? I need a Sarah Jane. <laughs> I wanted a Sarah Jane, but I was a little girl and didn't understand why. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, I want all of you to know that we did struggle. Not just me, but I did struggle as much as my father did, because I was one of those recipients in the state of Virginia during the time of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. All black schools had been called Southampton County schools. The white schools were called, were called Southampton County training schools. You train a dog. Mm -hmm. And all of the white schools <laughs> were called uh, Southampton High. So at the time with me being there, I, I didn't even realize it. I was a part of it. Going to school, my dad on the page maybe said 25 cents for a book. But the white students had the books before we did, and therefore only the teacher who had the full book. When we got it, the papers were torn out. So it brings me tears to let you know from whence I've come. It's been a long route. I used to be that little girl in a cart that would straddle my legs, driving that horse and cart to go up to the field to get the watermelons that my sisters and brothers we're going to put in that car. But today, I can truthfully say, and this, I'm being humble, not for fame, but I am now a, a local actress, and I starred in the movie, The Black Candidate That Was Running for President, <laughs> Dr. B. Carson, and I've uh, done about 26 movies and still acting. So I want to thank all of you for the attention. I'm sorry. Thank you. 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 Thank
basically got the monument built, that two monuments on the Detroit River for the Underground Railroad and those people. Yeah. So it's because of your influence. And also, do you know anything about the, um, the runaway societies that were up in the mountains, like between New York and, and New Jersey? Uh, they were called, I, I think now they're given the pop of the Jackson Whites. Jackson Whites. Uh, yeah. My, uh, my wife Sharon, the anthropology student, she knows a whole lot about uh, the Jackson Whites and my Islamic grandfather, his third of four wives, she was a member of the Jackson Whites. Okay. I've been up there amongst those folks. Yeah. Because I think my family came from the rock jumpers who were up there with them, but they were, I guess, I don't know if a different clan or they were some other people, but the, the definitely rock jumpers. the rock jumpers. Yeah, the only way you could get to their encampment was to know the rocks to jump across the river. And um, they weren't discovered until, and, and these people supposedly were the runaways and the, um, the, the, the descendants of folks from the uh, Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. They ran up to the mountains and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, they weren't supposedly discovered until the 1920s. Right. So that's, I, yeah, so that's how well hidden they were. Yeah. So anyhow. Sharon, it's, so it's, 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 it's wonderful to see you. And Johan's still here, Johan? Yeah. Yeah. You know, John, this, this is something we've been talking about. You know, I, talk, I taught this young lady in junior high school and at Michigan State. You know, and people like me got to at Michigan State teaching because of the activists of, activism of these young people. You know, that means powers that be had no plans to have a Negro like me in classroom teaching. Thank you, thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to know if you could speak to uh, the direct impact of slave values to the hotly discussed recent issue of Second Amendment. Um, you know, this country has a history of trying to keep us uneducated and unarmed. Mm -hmm. When Reconstruction broke down, first thing they wanted to do was take brothers and sisters' guns uh, uh, away from us. You know, because as, as David Walker said, you know, these people are great cowards. You know, they like to attack you in mobs and so forth. You've seen these Donald Trump rallies where they push him one sister out and all like that. Um, but yeah, there's, 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 there's a, a definite connection between that. This is what, what made the Black Panther Party such a fearsome force in this country, you know, just to, just to show up armed to stop some of these police uh, uh, tortures okay, of black people was, was a problematic thing. You know, it's all right for the police to shoot us up, but when somebody shoots back, you know, then it's a tragedy. They don't come to our, you know, the, the, the television cameras don't come to our funerals, but they go to the police funerals, you know. But there's a definite connection with that, you know. These stand your ground laws, okay, which exist here in the state of Michigan, even, you know. It's always somebody black who gets cut down in that. So the issue of guns and, and you know, Second Amendment and, and the Underground Railroad, slave rebellions, all of this stuff, you know. The prison system, system started once slavery ended. Because doing slavery, you know, most of us were already in, in the lockup. I don't know who is young lady. <laughs> My editor <Okay>. speaks. <laughs> editor, editor and personal manager. Um, I, uh, Dr. My Peters. wife, Sharon Peters. Mm -hmm. Wife of almost 45 years. I was I was in the cradle when I um, Dr. Peters, um, a believer as you are in the importance of symbolism, I wanted to ask you if you would just please stand and show the audience your T-shirt. Byron on that. 
Dr. Peters, can you uh, give us a brief list of the major works that we should read in order to get a deeper understanding of, of Nat Turner? What books would you recommend? Um, Herbert Atzeker's book on Nat Turner. Herbert Atzeker is, is, the, is the author of uh, American Negro Slave Revolts, you know, also called Afro-American Slave Revolts. But Atzeker's book is his choice. Uh, Herbert Greenberg, uh, uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Greenberg, who was depicted in the film, he has one of these case studies of Nat Turner, which is uh, a must read, you know, because it, uh, it includes uh, other source material, including his constitutional Whig uh, uh, essay uh, that uh, apparently Thomas Gray wrote, okay? But you get a full sense of holding that kind of scene now. Uh, but for me, uh, extra valuable is uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson's book, Black Rebellion. You heard me mention Wentworth Higginson. Uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson uh, was like John Brown, like Mark Twain, like, like uh, Herman Melville, you know. Serious white writers, you know what I'm saying, that, that, that save white people's good name. You know, <laughs> seriously. I was an English major. Most of these people, we had to study this shit. <clears throat> you know, I mean, they didn't. Racist, okay, racist. Okay. Wentworth Higginson was the first, and the Harvard guy, too. Okay. Uh, he's the first white to be the general of black troops in the Civil War. Okay. His book, Life in a Black Army Regiment, oh, okay. uh, but that, like, what's called Black Rebellions, is essays on the Maroons of Jamaica, okay, the Maroons of Suriname, Gabriel Prosser, then Mark and Nat Turner. 1850, 1860, they are extra precious because he, he's writing from newspaper sources that nobody else uh, has, okay. Uh, but those, to me, are the major. Uh, uh, Kenneth Greenberg's piece, anything that has Nat Turner's, uh, uh, that has the confessions, is pulled together by Thomas Gray. It's a powerful read, you know. Uh, Thomas Gray was uh, chased out of town because of his depiction of that time, you know. Having the audacity to talk about the brother's intelligence, you know, uh, uh, but to show him, you know, as, uh, uh, as more than a talking gorilla, which is how we were typically referred to in that era. You know. uh, I have, uh, Charles, a, a bibliography of everything from my presentation that I'll share with you. You can put it on the website. That, that, uh, it's the whole notion of, of rebellions, you know, uh, and resistance. It's so important uh, uh, to the future of this country. You know, the demographics are changing rapidly in this country. And so many old heads are scared to death to talk about the truth. That's right. oh, like, 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 like Miss Black. Like, Poor Miss Kitty Futrell. Wall is wrong. Oh, this is so sad. You know. All right, my brother. Hey, first I want to thank Charles and you for being dropping this knowledge on us. Can you be impressed? <laughs> yeah, man. It's a wonderful thing to uh, be in your presence and, and hear this. Uh, It's, it's a wonderful thing to see you again and hear you and your lovely wife. And for Charles to put this together as he's been doing, you know, he's a real pioneer, a real forward thinking brother. I appreciate it. But I wanted to, uh, you, you alluded to the fact of, of the, the great deception that goes on, particularly when there's something that uh, they want to um, take your mind off of or hide from. But I want you, if you will, to speak to us about the music that's happening today. Um, Kenny Green of the Green Mosley Complex, there was a time when I saw Sharon Peters and Sharon Sexton shaking them down to the Green Mosley Complex up in Eastland. <laughs> the hell of a piano player, wonderful piano player. Thank you. Uh, you know, the, the, the first thing I want to say about the uh, 
the music, Kenny, is, is that great black music continues to be made and listened to. Hmm? Uh, a brother like you should be rich and famous okay, and more widely known, okay? but because you are uh, who and what you are, uh, these people keep you uh, in the dark, you know. Uh, I've taught classes on, you know, black music and social change and hip hop and so forth for, for, for a long time, you know, and, and uh, the great black music uh, uh, remains strong. You have to search for it, but you know, it's like, like, like in the days of slavery, the Nat Turner song, did you hear me repeat? You know, songs like Wild Negro Bill from Red Pepper Hill, all like that. You know, uh, the great black music is always underground in a world that hates us and wants us to think that Lil Wayne is who our children need to be. You know what I'm saying? So, so you know, there's, there's plenty of coonery that's going on, you know? Plenty of black music that's about pimping and, and, uh, and, and prostituting their children here, so I'm cleaning up my vocab here some, somewhat. Okay. Uh, there's plenty of music like that, but that's what the airwaves are filled with, and these people are merely doing their jobs. You know, we'd like to think they'd be do better, you know, if they do better, maybe they would do better, you know. Uh, but I don't think we should be dismayed to think that what's on TV and the radio is all it is, because it's simply not true, you know. Uh, uh, just like films can go underground with DVDs and so forth, if you if you look online, you can find black music as strong and scary as the Nat Turner song, that's what you're looking for. Another MSU brother. <laughs> I remember bringing them over the complex. Yeah, I know you do. They have them, they have brothers. Yeah, yeah. They still hitting it, I'm told. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Jamie, and thank you all. Yeah, I really I enjoyed this program. Um, my question is about basically just where do you see the role of um, violent resistance today in um, our resistance, various resistance struggles of the day in this sort of um, where we are in terms of just like civil disobedience um, and so just violent resistance in today. Well, you know, uh, violence has always been forced on us, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a, a kind of trick bag this would be like Elvis Cleaver. I got the Black Panther Party into when you get to flexing too much. Yeah, but the Black Panther Party, their original name was the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Okay. Uh, and they showed up uh, as somebody still needs to show up at the scene of these police huntings of our people. You know what I'm saying? Anytime a sister uh, gets arrested, Sandra Bland, somebody needs to be in, in the cell with you okay, uh, to protect you. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, at, at the risk of, sound, of sounding bloodthirsty, in the United States of America, you have to be prepared to defend yourself. That's right. Yeah. It's just, you know, uh, this sister here in Detroit, and I'm just pleased to see that the, that the citizenry in Wayne County, uh, uh, you know this sister that got murdered? Uh, what was her name? Renisha McBride in Dearborn. You know, uh, Renisha and a, and, a, and a young black man, a former football player from FAMU down in North Carolina, they went to white people's homes looking for help and got murdered. You know, uh, in Renisha McBride's uh, trial, the white woman lawyer described her as looking like an ugly man. This is in the courtroom. Mm. You know, it did my heart good to hear the jury come back and say, send this suckers out, send them off to jail. You know, uh, but uh, in circumstances like that, you know, we, we're in a society where a person has to be prepared to uh, defend themselves. We, we're in that kind of world. Okay? Uh, uh, to, to advocate uh, wholesale slaughtering people and so forth, nobody. No, no decent person, uh, no sane person would advocate that as a way to conduct business. You know, uh, we get not enough, but we get proofs of people in, in this country 
that are trying to work this work this mess out, you know. But if you if you do the Elbridge Cleaver and, and, and pick up a 45 against people with stone and rifles, you're, you're gonna get wiped out, you know. Uh, uh, but at the same time, people have to be prepared to defend themselves without question, without question. When Barack Obama got er, er, elected, in both cases, the gun shops uh, sold out of, out of bullets and so forth, in that week, okay? You can't ignore that. You can't pray that away. You can't pray that away. The deacons for self-defense. Right? Robert Williams. Okay. Uh, these people. These people made an, an immense difference because cowards. Hmm. They know their ass ain't bulletproof. Okay. Uh, they come at you in numbers. You know you have to be prepared to uh, defend yourself. You know, but but to, but but to be like them. This is. My people in West Virginia, my great grandmother, my parents, they said, you know, the worst thing you can do is to be like a white racist. Huh? Well, that's what I was taught. It's the worst thing you can do is to be like them. And they can yeah. say them to make it sound like something that smells like sulfur. You know? Huh? Uh, because most of us are raised to have a sense to, uh, to judge and know uh, the good from the bad. Uh, uh, the sane and the, and, and the wicked, you know. And when, if your first response is to is to pick up a gun, it's it's just hard to justify, you know. Yeah. Every day, some kid getting killed in the crosswalk. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. huh? uh, some Negro in Detroit uh, shot somebody's kid because somebody didn't bring back that Grand Theft Auto game quick enough. <laughs> gun down the house, you know. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's a very ticklish kind of proposition, you know? Uh, but we live in a world where people have to be prepared to defend themselves because there's a lot of crazy out there. Right. There's a lot of crazy out there. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, how you doing, Doc? Yeah, how you doing, brother? All right. He was a grad student when I was in college. <laughs> I remember him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Sing anyway. singing, we shall overcome, right? <laughs> I think I'd rather be swinging than singing. <laughs> but uh, um, I remember it was a good question to really ask you about music because I, I think last time I talked to you, I was asking you about Gil Scott here. And mm -hmm. that's something that I think we certainly need to lift up. And mm -hmm. somebody who was a, a prolific uh, song, singer and songwriter and always brought revolution to us. But I wanted to know if there was any uh, people, any black folks who wrote any books uh, that you were aware of on that term. You know, instead of you know, white writers, I mean, they made me do it. I mean, to me, they're not really relevant. <laughs> but, mm. you know, are there any black folks, you know, who, um, uh, you know, who, who did any work that maybe we could recommend? Currently, no. Okay. William Wells Brown, the old slave writer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, he wrote about that term. Uh, Can you get uh, that book? Is that book? Yeah, uh, Black Rebellion. Okay. Wells Brown, who, who was depicted in the film. Yeah, all of Wells Brown stuff is, is remarkable. Wells Brown was, was a, a, a slave who, once he broke free, uh, he took people to freedom right here at the Detroit River. Okay? But his story is remarkable because his, his master was a, was a medical doctor, mm -hmm. and he used Wells Brown you know, to, to service people. Wells Brown became an MD, the first black man to write a novel. Okay, a play and history and so forth. So his stuff is out there. But the main thing I mentioned here uh, is, is uh, uh, Nate Parker's book. Okay, he's doing a, the, the Malcolm Van Peebles early Spike Lee type thing. You know, when my movie come out, you know, I got a, a hip soundtrack. I got a book. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm advertising for myself. You know, but the, I'm looking forward to that book. Uh, with great anticipation, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do the Skippy Gates and read it one night, you know, because I, 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 I pre-ordered it, you know, but that will be, you know, and it's like, it's like a, a particular subject, you know, you walk into a publishing house with your book on that term, right? You know, <laughs> they will look cock out at you. Highly Jerema, Highly Jerema, whose film Sanko Fowler about slavery and slave rebellions. Uh, he told me some years ago, when I still lived in Lansing, that uh, when he when he got to the idea to make this film, he went to Spike Lee, mm -hmm. he went to John Singleton, okay, he went to Ozzie Davis, okay, uh, and, and, and 
any other black filmmakers.